721 here, Big 550 KTRS. It was a story that came out uh, earlier in the week about the manufacturing of meth is down all around the Midwest. We don't believe anything until we talk to our guy, Jason Grellner, Sheriff of Franklin County. Good morning, Jason Grellner. Good morning. How are you this morning? We're doing good. Thanks for checking in. Uh, is meth labs, are the busts down? What are you seeing on the front lines? Yes, we're seeing a huge decrease in meth labs all across Missouri, uh, into Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, Oklahoma, Kansas. And they're being driven down by laws regarding uh, prescriptions for pseudofedrine as well as an influx of Mexican methamphetamine to fill the void left behind by the by vacating those meth labs. Uh, first, let's let's talk about production. You've mentioned on the show the the one hit method where they uh, make it uh, while shaking a soda bottle while driving down the highway. Are we seeing a decrease in that method too? We are. You know, that was the most lucrative method of manufacturing methamphetamine for about the last three and a half to four years. Uh, that method is extremely dangerous. Uh, the volatile chemicals that are inside those bottles are not compatible with each other. We're seeing a lot of fires and explosions, a lot of burn victims. Uh, you know, St. John uh, Mercy uh, Hospital was seeing up to a quarter of their beds to a third of their beds being taken up by meth lab burn victims. Those numbers are down. Uh, and we're glad to see that. You know, methamphetamine is a horrible scourge, a horrible problem for the addicts and for the family of the addicts. But meth labs are a horrible problem for all the citizens of the state of Missouri uh, because when those fires and explosions occur, whether they're in a vehicle or whether they're in an apartment building or a hotel room, they endanger the lives of, of citizens all around them. You've, you've told us uh, horrific stories about meth addicts lining up at pharmacies knowing when the uh, pseudoephedrine and the cold medicine is going to be delivered. Are we seeing a decrease in that pseudoephedrine sales because of this? We certainly are. You know, we fought hard across the state of Missouri. We're now 75 communities throughout the state of Missouri that no longer sell pseudoephedrine unless they have a prescription. Uh, we fought hard in Fenton for that, and even after uh, the council voted, uh, we didn't get enough votes to do that. Both of the Walgreens stores in Fenton, Missouri, decided on their own to remove pseudofedrin and only sell it with a prescription. Uh, and the amount of sales that dropped at those two stores were astronomical. At the same time, they saw their shoplifting numbers go way down. They saw their calls for police go way down. Uh, and the number of syringes that they were finding on the parking lot and bathrooms went way down also. So with all of this decreased meth production, does it equate to a decreased use of meth? It does. I think that we're going to see that in the long run, McCall. What we're going to see is, is when there's less availability of methamphetamine from homemade meth labs, uh, less socialization of people growing up in those homes, seeing that manufacturing methamphetamine is just a way of life, uh, that we're going to see that decrease. We've still got a good uh, base of methamphetamine addicts out there that need the drug uh, because of the way that the things are chemically altered. Uh, but I think in the future what you're going to see is a decreased use of meth. Now, obviously, uh, the buzzword is opium. Uh, with heroin and prescription drug abuse, you know, death from accidental overdose is the number one cause of accidental death in the United States at the current time. And that's not being fueled by meth. It's not being fueled by coke or heroin. That is being fueled 75% by accidental medication overdose. And most of those are, are opium overdoses. Who are the meth users these days in, in Missouri? Is it still a cross-section of the community? It really is. It's, it's still a cross-section of those in their, their early to mid-20s uh, through, actually, we've seen individuals old as 72 years old. Now, that's, that's quite odd. I think the youngest I've ever had was 14. But again, that child was growing up in a house where he was socialized to believe that's just how things went everywhere. Uh, but yet, yeah, really, it's a 20- to 30-year-old uh, problem. Uh, it is a rural problem throughout Missouri, um, and it continues to be a rural problem even with a decrease in meth labs. Now, Indiana, on the other hand, is seeing an uptick in meth labs. In fact, all across the Midwest, we're seeing decreases as much as 40 and 50 percent, but Indiana is proving to be up 5 percent this year and has done little to nothing in their state legislature uh, to affect the sale of pseudofedrine. Now, we are really lucky to have Bill Moskoff and uh, his men and women working at Westport Pharmaceuticals right there in Maryland Heights who developed a pseudofedrine product that can't be manufactured into methamphetamine 
that is making it easier on communities to go to prescription only and then allow for the sale of products such as their Zephrex D that can't be manufactured in the map. I want to go back to heroin for a second. You used to tell us that the heroin epidemic was fueling the meth epidemic and the meth epidemic was fueling the heroin epidemic. Do you still see those two connected? Not as much. You know, it used to be that because of the pseudofedrine pill sales, uh, individuals could make money for startup in their heroin business. Uh, because of the drop in methamphetamine labs, we're not seeing that as much. We still see those individuals that continue to manufacture methamphetamine doing business in uh, the inner city area where there are much there are a larger amount of pharmacies that individuals can get to in a short period of time. And we still see them working together with inner city crime uh, to get those pills out and that money then transferred into the heroin trade. But that has really diminished. Uh, the heroin trade at this point uh, has taken on a life of its own. Uh, we're watching it closely uh, because of the fentanyl and the other drugs that are being mixed in with the heroin uh, to increase its potency. I want to go back. You said 70, in this interview, you said 75% of the people who die of a heroin overdose do it through some, were you were saying it was some type of some pharmaceutical pill? Is that what you were saying? Yeah, and that's exactly right. And that's always been our problem. You know, heroin is a really easy buzzword and a catchword for the media and for people. They hear the word heroin, they instinctively think bad. But when I say words like hydrocodone and Vicodin and Oxycontin and Oxycodone, people have visions of doctors and hospitals and surgery uh, and cleanliness because those are medicines that are prescribed to us. The U.S. has about 4% of the world's population. We use 99.3% of the entire world's hydrocodone. It is the number one most prescribed drug in the United States for over a decade. Uh, opium sales in the United States are a $63.5 billion a year industry. And that industry is what has fueled uh, our heroin sales. Uh, and that is because Mexican drug cartels are shrewd businessmen that look to the United States. Uh, they saw our love affair with opium through prescription opioids. And they just began to fuel that with heroin. Uh, to take over a portion of that $63.5 billion a year market. Uh, we didn't get here overnight. This was a 30-year problem starting back in 1981, and uh, we're not going to get out of it overnight. But uh, with the help of narcotics officers throughout the United States, as well as the DEA and the FDA, we're working hard to retrain doctors and talk to them about the prescribing habits. So these doctors uh, are prescribing these pills. Florida was known as a, as a pill factory for years they have since tried to curtail that down in florida do we have a similar problem in that it's unregulated and and these doctors can just hand out all these pills they want certainly in missouri is the only state in the united states at the current time that does not have a prescription drug monitoring program and that program helps doctors to see what other doctors are prescribing and it helps pharmacists to see what other pharmacists are dispensing and right now, Missouri is the only state, including the territories of Guam and Puerto Rico, that does not have that program. We are ripe for pill mills, which are organized crime, uh, masquerading as doctors, uh, where you go into these clinics that do nothing but prescribe and over-prescribe opioids, benzodiazepines, and muscle relaxants uh, to get more people addicted uh, and to make a lot of cash. Jason Grellner, we're lucky to have you on our side. Jason Grellner, Sheriff of Franklin County and on the front lines of the drug war. Jason Grellner, thanks and be safe out there. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me on today. You got it. 7.30. Some sobering and interesting news. Yes. How yeah. can Missouri be the only state? Well, that, well, I know. but it's, it's, <laughs> We don't have enough time to explain I, I that. I know. 4% of the population, 99% of the uh, uh, prescription pills are here, and 4% of the population, safe to say we have a problem. 730 KTRS.